Monday the 8th of April, and a little bit later than usual, it's your Totally Football Show running up all the weekends. Act Sean here with us, Charlie Eccleshare, who was at uh, Spurs yesterday for the Spurs Forest. Jay Harris, who the day before was at Villa Park for that mad game with Brentford. And also on our big screen, Daniel Story, who Sunday afternoon was at Clown Car Central for Man United Liverpool. Yeah. What sights you've seen, the three of you? Woof. Yeah. What a weekend. What a weekend. Mm -hmm. Kind of football that you should know better, but you can't help loving, I think Karl Anker <laughs> described that. What, what was your favourite bit of the weekend, Daniel Story? Uh, probably Bruno's goal at Old Trafford. Just to, you know, you say clown car. Just the kind of Liverpool have had 17 shots, Manchester United have had one. There's one of those amazing stat graphics where there's like a big cluster of Liverpool shots around the area. And then there's this arrow from around near the halfway line straight towards <laughs> Liverpool's goal. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was chaos. The sort of chaos at Manchester United where you, um, you cannot get used to it, even though you know it's coming. You, know, you watch them against Chelsea and you think, well, this is obviously going to be another mad game. You think, we can't be that mad. It has to calm down at some point. And it, it never ratchets mm, down. Hold my beer, that, said Man United. That game and the way that it played out with the missed chances is sort of vindication for why football fans are complete maniacs. Because you watch a game like that, you're 1-0 up, you're battering your opponents, but you're still saying, we're, we're not going to win this game. We're 100% not going to win this game because this is what happens in football. You don't take chances, yada, yada, yada. And so it proved. There you go. Jay, what stood out for you? Probably Kobe Mainu's goal. Mm -hmm. um, his rise this season keeps getting better and better and better. And every time you think it's kind of peaked um, with his performances for England in the international break, he pulls out a goal like that. And yeah, he's an incredible footballer to watch. Mm -hmm. Although he was maybe at fault for the first goal, but I'm sure we'll get on to that. OK. All right. And Charlie? I would go along with that, yeah. Sorry to be boring, but that was It's all about the Man United Liverpool. That goal, that mm. Mainu goal was so special. Mm. As has been said, shades of that famous Makeda... Yeah. Goal that was obviously that was in a title this run. This is in better. For United. Having gone back and watched that, would you say? Possibly what because it's sort of further behind him. I the think he's got to tougher. beat more. Yeah, it's the angle is tougher because he's got to beat more players to get it mm. in. It's slightly more overhead, I think, than McKay's. He's, he's not really. Isn't his back to goal when he takes that first touch as well? Because mm. it's quite. It's, it's a little bit similar to De Bruyne's goal against Crystal Palace, right? Mm. In terms of it's both curled yeah. into the top corner, but I think De Bruyne's kind of coming at it, knowing straight away he's hitting it there. Right. But I feel like mainly basically just turns. Hits it and then that it goes into the top corner. Makeda, of course, who went on to have that incredible career <laughs> for Man United. I wonder how that Manu go went down with the stats community. Manu famously is uh, not uh, beloved by the stats community. Why is that? Apparently, his numbers aren't great. Uh, there are a lot of areas in which he is deficient. So for all the hype, uh, so, some of them anyway have poured cold water on that hype. I'm not saying I subscribe to this. Right. By the way, okay. But, but Jay uh, flagging out one potential issue with made his performance on Sunday, which we'll, we'll touch on very, very shortly. Uh, the results, anyway, across what is, I think, match day 31 of this Premier League season? Very 31, so, yeah. yeah. City, 4-2 winners away at Crystal Palace to kick things off on Saturday. Arsenal responded later that day with a 3-0 win at Brighton. They saw your chaos. They raised you control. And then on Sunday, Liverpool held 2-2 at Man United, which means that Arsenal are back on top. Goal difference separating them from Liverpool, with City a point behind. At the other end, Sheffield United came from behind twice to get a 2-2 draw at Chelsea. Luton got their first win in 11, beating Bournemouth 2-1, while Everton ended their 13-game run without a win. And, incidentally, Burnley's recent unbeaten spell uh, by beating the Clarets 1-0 with, what's this, a second goal in a row from Dominic Cavalloon. Uh, meanwhile, Spurs beat Nottingham Forest 3-1. That moves them back into fourth above Aston Villa, who had themselves a mad 3-3 draw with Brentford. Uh, Newcastle won 1-0 at Fulham. And West Ham were 2-1 winners at Wolves, featuring the worst decision that Gary O'Neill's ever seen. Which is saying something. Yeah, he's seen a few this season. Seen a few. Him. Just before we get into events at Old Trafford, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, just to preempt the pedants, technically I think that was... Uh, game week 32 right? because there was a weekend where there were lots of FA Cup ties sure and there were only four yeah. Premier League so pitches. most teams have played 31 but some have played 32 some have played 32 your Villas your Fulhams for instance ok Man United and Liverpool Daniel you were there where to begin where to begin the first half was 
all about Liverpool's total dominance and it led to Luis Diaz's goal. But then the concert, wayward back pass and your beloved Bruno Fernandes equaliser and chaos was unleashed. It was. It, it, it reminded me um, and continued to remind me, even though Manchester United only drew the game, it reminded me of the, the game at the Etihad a few years ago when, when Man City were 2 up at half-time. Uh, and everyone was sort of lamenting Manchester United's, mm-hmm. Jose Mourinho's Manchester United at that point, and Paul Pogba in particular, uh, which we were all doing in the press room about Bruno at half time because he, he'd, he'd wasted passes, he'd delayed a pass to put Garnaccio through on goal for the disallowed goal. Uh, and then in that game, Pogba scores twice pretty quickly, and Bruno scored once from, from as you say, downtown pretty quickly. <sighs> Manchester United just have this ability to. Um, through no particularly skill or quality of their own, but just to make teams miss chances. It's almost as if it's it's too much chaos in this kind of ultra-controlled sport now with managers kind of sort of trying to control every controllable and trying to calculate every attacking move. You don't often get six on three four or five <laughs> times a game, and yet that's what mm. happened. And Liverpool pretty much managed to miss all of those chances. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think you know. I think playing against a Manchester United team when you don't know what you're going to get, other than mania, is is a really hard thing to do. Might, might um, they actually be defending well in some arcane fashion? I think Harry Maguire was really good yesterday. I thought he was Manchester United's possibly even Manchester United's best player. Um, but I, I don't think you can describe it as doing anything well. I think you can describe it as. <laughs> Um, being able to surge some spirit from behind that still lingers. I think the, you've got shades of, of, of Solskjaer's Manchester United where the individuals produce enough moments to kind of put off um, outright calamity until eventually everyone agrees that we need to move on from this situation. I do also think that Liverpool were, were really, really poor in the final third. The decision making was. Mm. Dreadful at times. What, what, um, I kind of found a stat. They, so Liverpool, if Liverpool don't win the league this mm. year, it will be because of their results against the top six teams. They won eight of ten games against them last year. They've won one of eight so far this year. And in those seven winless games, they've had 125 shots and scored seven goals. So the average in the Premier League is teams pretty much score with one in every nine shots. In those games, Liverpool are scoring with one in every 18. And you don't, you don't often have shots of that volume against your top six peers. And when you do, you've got to take them. You know, Diaz skewed over the bar. Do you, Nunes managed to hit a shot backwards from about three yards, mm. I think. It looked like he was trying to pass to no one, but I think he was trying to shoot. Um, you know, Mohamed Salah misses one with his right foot. He balloons over the bar from about five yards. It, it just That on repeat has been happening in too many games against top six teams this year. And, and for all the kind of defensive absentees and the poor pass from, from cancer to the, to the goal, that's what will cost them. I mean, two draws against United mm. in the league. both get you know, and the Two draws loss. with 62 shots. Yeah. In. I think I saw something was like 87 in the three games against United, mm. one of which they lost and two of which they drew. And mm. obviously that not going through in the FA Cup could be big in the final reckoning. And these those four points... Yeah, they, they look like being really important, potentially. Mm. It's funny to think about Liverpool with their, their Achilles heel being the three up front, but that's the issue now, Jay. Yeah, definitely. As, as has been mentioned, they, especially in the first half, were just all over Manchester United. And obviously, Daniel's kind of mentioned that I completely agree with him that Maguire was probably Manchester United's best player, but he's basically just putting out fires. I, mm. I feel like Manchester United just have this unique ability to just draw everybody else into their nonsense. And so when you've got so many situations where it's six on three, I think Liverpool's players just get a little bit carried away and think it's inevitable that we're going to win 2-0, 3-0, 4-0. And they just become very wasteful. I know Salah's not really hit the height since he's come back from that hamstring injury he suffered at AFCON as well. And you can clearly see that in, in some of the decisions he makes. But Liverpool should have been absolutely streets ahead. And I was seeing on social media at half time so many jokes about it's inevitable inevitable Man United will score with their first shot of this game and as Charlie mentioned earlier it is just this mad thing we call football just delivers we all knew it was going to happen and yet we're still surprised when it does happen but um well also the way that it happened then the Maynou uh goal which put them ahead but but just quickly on Mm. the the Maynou goal and it was spoken about on Sky Sports at half time 
He very clearly doesn't quite know who he's supposed to be Oh, marking. sorry, on the Luis Diaz goal. On the Luis Diaz goal, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. So it's very clear that Maynard's not 100% sure who right. he should be marking. So is that the fault of an 18-year-old who looks very good? Well, maybe not according to the stats, guys, but <laughs> <laughs> looks very good, um, but is still very inexperienced? Or is that a fault of Ten Hag and the coaches not properly saying right. who should be marking who at these set pieces? And routines? the singular thing about that was that they analysed it. It looked like it was him. Then they went, no, actually, it's not his fault. They never really said whose fault they thought it should be. And that's obviously an issue that United had as well, because on the very next set piece that Liverpool had, Lo and behold, the same thing happened. Luis Diaz went completely unmarked, very nearly got his head to, I think, a corner. And uh, so so we continue. Whose fault yeah. was it then, the well, Luis Diaz goal? I, I think there are just so many big structural issues with this team. I mean, it's incredible. I know that was a set-piece situation, mm. but like these huge wide-open spaces that Liverpool were just flooding into, it, it's, it's cra the spacings are just all wrong. It's crazy. Um, and I... <laughs> It's great to watch. It's incredibly entertaining. You know, like the Chelsea game on Thursday night as well was just a complete thrill ride. But I think if I'm a Man United fan, watch that. I'm just like, this is this is chaos. Mm. This is complete madness. And we're not talking about a manager who's been there a few months. You're saying, okay, let let him bed in. This is almost the end of his second season. Right. Like, I, yeah, I find it surprising that there's maybe this is harsh, but there's like. Any debate that they should get rid of him in the summer? The increasing... I mean, like, is that harsh? The, the what, word what's seems the to be that he's still going to be there next season because they can't get other people not only to make the decisions about hiring uh, some replacement, but also they, the, the people they'd like maybe aren't available. Daniel, you're waggling a finger at us. Yeah, I, I, I was watching the game yesterday to, to kind of work out what piece I was going to write. And in the end, I, I went with the kind of Liverpool wasters because I thought that probably was the story of the game. But, but for, there were four times between the 60th and the 70th minute, maybe 65th and 75th, where Casemiro was caught 40 yards from Liverpool's goal and had to jog back. And, and he was probably sprinting, but I think he's probably the slowest player in the Premier League at the moment. So he was kind of half jogging back as the game sprinted past him. And... Casemiro has been around long enough that he he knows what he's best at, and that is mopping up in front of a defence and being the kind of the guardsman when all the other midfielders have, have tumbled forward. And that will happen because you've got Hoyland, you've got Rashford, you've got Garnaccio, you've got Mane who really wants to go there, you've got Bruno who basically plays where he wants. I, I that, that has to be a systemic issue that Casemiro is finding himself when Man United lose the ball 40 yards in the opposition goal with 70 yards to run back and he's never going to make it. I, I don't get how someone's not just said, why don't you just kind of stand and do what you used to do for Real Madrid, which was the reason we signed you for £60 million at the age you are, rather than kind of getting caught up in all this kind of ephemera of we need to be this bells and whistles and attacking and you know we want to be dominating in the final third. It, it just doesn't work with a player like Casemiro and I... I Yes, you could say, look, you, uh, the experience you've got, why don't you kind of make that decision yourself? But it must be a team issue because he, he didn't used to do that for Real Madrid. He didn't used to get caught that side of the mm. ball with so much space behind I mean, that's him. Been, it's, that's the big issue with Man United's season, isn't it? Midfielders getting caught wildly upfield when... Yeah, but that signing as well, you sign a player who's 30 years old mm. for 60 million plus 10 add-ons or whatever it was, who I think most thought, wow, that's a pretty you know, good deal for Real Madrid to be spending that much money. That It just seems like there have been so many of those kind of short-term fixes. Like that, you know, and then you, they bring in Anthony for all that money as well. Like, I don't know like, what can Ten Hag really point to and say... I, I mean, he. Do, I, I heard him say, oh, but we've got a lot of young players. So it's kind of like, OK, well, let's just sort of... Just another thing. Last week and a half, when mm -hmm. they played Brentford, Chelsea and Liverpool, mm -hmm. they've conceded, what, three... Well, four goals in the 90, after the 90th minute, which is just ridiculous. Um, they somehow managed to sneak away with a point against Brentford when Brentford were all over them and Thomas right. Frank was saying, we performed better today than when we beat them 4-0. You've just got the farcical end to the Chelsea game where they just completely throw it away. And I think Ten Hag afterwards was talking about, you know, concentration issues, etc. And I thought Wan-Bissaka had a pretty good game but it's just a completely needless lunge. Yeah. So if players are making the same mistakes and you keep conceding these goals over and over again, it's just not sustainable. I'm in the same camp as Charlie that Manchester United's new owners have an opportunity to just have a clean break from Ten Hag and say, we're going to put someone new in. But if they persist with him, he's only got a year left on his contract. So 
you probably have to give him a new one because otherwise the entirety of next season, there's just going to be this constant noise about, is he staying, is he going? Brilliant. And you could essentially stick with him <laughs> and then by December decide this gamble was a complete waste of time. Daniel, without getting into the rights and wrongs of it, is, is your feeling that they are planning for next season with Ten Hag at the moment? I think you kind of mentioned it earlier. The, the the sticking point is that there's nobody obvious to replace him. I think if you were going to... The level of manager they were looking at at the time of the Ten Hag appointment when, when managers like Zidane were, were discussed, I, I don't see why any of them would look at Manchester United and think this is a good thing to do. What you need now is a is a manager to sort of settle things down, which is, I think, what Ten Hag was supposed to be. Um, and so was Van Gaal and so was Mourinho and, you know, yada, yada. Um, the only manager that that seems to be jumping out to people is is Graham Potter, and you know he's just had a Chelsea job where it, 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 the most similar club to Manchester United in the Premier League at the moment in terms of the amount of change, the amount of questions about the leadership, the amount of kind of nonsense on the pitch and the late goals. Um, if he takes it, he's a brave man because I think that could damage his reputation. And after that, you think, well, who? Who really is there? I mean, Southgate's been talked about. and the, the, the only one I look at and think that's, that's worth building around if they think he's good enough with what he's done this season is Kieran McKenna. But then that's a huge mm. gamble for, for a club that hasn't had a successful Surely Southgate is the bigger, would be the biggest gamble of all. He hasn't had any club football in 15 yeah, years, I mean, and uh, even then. But isn't, not to get all kind of keezy about this, but aren't, haven't they brought in these enormous brains? Like, aren't they there to kind of see managers that we can't necessarily and, and be bold and be brave right. and say, actually, we've, using our extensive scouting networks or whatever, scoured the world and we found this person who we think will be really good. Or they do be bold. I mean, Arsenal brought in Mikel Arteta, who never managed a game in his life. Right. Is there someone like that out there? Could that be a McKenna? Is there someone else who maybe doesn't, who has very little experience, but because the skill is getting ahead of the curve and that's right. what United have not done. You know, they brought in Louis van Gaal, Wait, was way past his best. Jose Mourinho was way past his best. Solskjaer, I guess that was their attempt to do that. Mm. Didn't work out. Um, and Ten Hag, who it feels like his best days were with that Ajax team. So that's the skill of these people brought in to make these decisions. Right. To okay. see people beyond the England manager, well, which is just about the most obvious person <laughs> you could go for. <laughs> That's the thing. I guess they need to bring in those people who are going to make those decisions as part of uh, yeah. this ongoing thing. But you know what? We probably need to talk a little bit about Arsenal and, and, and Man City and what they got up to this weekend. Before we leave Sunday's 2-2 draw with Mo Salah's penalty equalising late on after that one beside challenge that you mentioned, uh, Jay, what were, the, what were the issues that the digital folks, our stats friends, would raise about Maynou's performance? I'm no, no, I don't think specifically about this game. But, but yeah, in, general, in general... What is it about this 18-year-old phenomenon that they're not <laughs> completely happy with? The, if you look on FB Ref, quite a few of his uh, lines aren't where they should be. I'm not sure the specific areas, but I right. just sort of... But is that maybe because Man United are just a mess? And like you said, the midfield structure is just completely disjointed. Very, very possibly. It's, Don't tell that to the stats guys. It's been too long since I went to FB Ref. What kind of are they? The pie chart people? No, they're not pie charts. No, you are no, the bar graphs. They're the decimal bar place. Bar they're the decimal place people. Okay. Um, yeah, there also is that kind of X X Casemiro rating if you're playing for Manchester United in that midfield. Because I think the reason I, I gently know without overanalyzing, I think the reason he he probably gets it slightly wrong on Diaz's goal is that he feels at the moment like he has to do everything. So every time a ball comes into the box, I'm going to need to be the one that heads it. I think we saw exactly the same with Willy Cambuala first half yesterday as well. These young players that come into the team feel like they have this onus, not just to, what should happen is that they should be the quieter ones that kind of bed in and settle into the team. In fact, they're coming in and thinking, I've got to fight seven fires a minute here just to keep my head above water. So you end up trying to do too much. And at the moment, that's working out for Manu because he's basically living out two years of a career in about three months. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, eventually he needs to kind of be able to refine that and become a midfielder who doesn't have to kind of this one man band of symbols and drums and triangles all at once because he's got to pass the ball and get the ball and score the goals and assist the goals and win his headers from corners it just doesn't work in the long term fair enough I mean just just very quickly on Liverpool as well yeah just that I mean this is amazing this is the first time they've dropped points to anyone other than City and Arsenal since November the 5th okay Luton away I mean they've been as much as against those absolute best teams they've 
drop some points. They have been unbelievably consistent. One thing I would say, and I said this a few weeks ago, is yeah. I do think if you keep having mad cat wins, yes. as much as everyone says... Not sustainable? It, yeah, well, I just think it's because it's Klopp, it's been framed as, that's what champions do. Right. And, emotion. you know, emotion, yeah. that will carry them through. But I said after that Forest game, I think, yeah, you can't, like, eventually you'll, you'll get unlucky. Mm. And this was a game they absolutely should have won. Um, but United... Yeah, We'll talk about what the two points drop means when we get on to the other two in the title race next. All right, Opta Supercomputer update. Charlie's got the ticker tape right there. Charlie, I believe I'm right in saying that it's now reading Man City as favourites for the title. What's those numbers? A little punch hole saying 39.7. Their chances of prevailing. Liverpool down to 31.3%. And Arsenal on 29%. Arsenal currently top of the table. Surely that's all wrong, Jay. Let's talk about their performance away at Brighton, which felt going into the weekend, I would say, like the tougher test that any of these teams was facing, Old Trafford notwithstanding. And certainly it was, it resulted in the most emphatic victory of all. The, you know, for your chaos, here is our control. Yeah, definitely. I think <clears throat> these two games against Luton and Brighton on paper could have tripped Arsenal up, especially when people were very quick to, to praise them for how well they performed against Manchester City, you know, taking four points against them across the course of the season. So obviously to rotate against Luton and get that win was really important. And then to just dispatch Brighton with not too much fuss, a team that's tripped Arsenal up, mainly up. Brighton have tripped Arsenal up at the Emirates in the last couple of seasons, but right. still the Zerbi's team kind of um, prey on teams that like to, you know, play high up the pitch, etc. And so I think Arsenal just did a really good job. And I think the, the Kai Havertz um, trajectory just keeps going up and up and up. I feel like it was even in October, November, there are still a lot of people very sceptical about that move. Right, what do, what do they say at RF football? Um, <laughs> I F think, F F F F oh, I think yeah. his numbers are good, yeah. Right. Well, actually, he's an interesting example, kind of the other way around, oh. because early on, the kind of headline was, Havertz is this big flop, da 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 But I think actually the people looking deeper were saying, well, actually, if you look at his off-the-ball runs and if you look mm. at his pressing, he, he's a very, like, Arteta has always loved him. And I right. think fan, you know, fans and people in the media, we look way more at outcomes than processes, obviously. And I think he was a quite a processy. He's doing all the right things. Mm. The goals and assists will come, mm. was the view at the club. Obviously, outside, it's just, he gets no goals, he gets no assists. What is this guy doing? Basically? Do you know who's a big fan of Kai Havertz? I do, yeah. Sir Andy Murray. Sir Andy Murray <laughs> describes Kai Havertz as easily one of the best forwards in the Premier League. Big Perfect. FPL man, Andy Murray. So he's probably across those numbers. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. All right. So Kai Havertz, big thumbs up. Who, who else gets the thumbs up for this um, domineering 3-0 win? Saka came back and yeah. I think it was a surprise that he'd missed the, the Luton game. Came back, scores from the penalty spot and Arsenal just kind of keep, keep ticking over and doing their job. I, th I think, I said this a couple of months ago, but I think... Arsenal have benefited from not being in the spotlight over the last few weeks where the narrative has been very much about can Liverpool um, win the title in Jurgen Klopp's final season. And I just wonder now if now that they're top mm. coming into this final run of games, is the attention going to ratchet back up on them again and, right. and how they're going to deal with that? OK, shout out to Leandro Trossard's goal against oh. his uh, form. <clears throat> lovely little stutter mm. just to throw the keeper on that. Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I, I give some love to Arsenal's defence because it is if they win the league over the next few weeks, it will be because of, of that defence. They've allowed less than five expected goals. Sorry to go all FBRF again, but they've they've allowed fewer than five expected goals uh, in 2024, which is easily less than half of Manchester City and, and Liverpool. They've only allowed 10 shots on target in the last eight games. <laughs> really. I'd say the only kind of flip side to that is that Arsenal basically haven't faced adversity yet they've not been behind this the calendar last... year no 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 it's kind of amazing. Well, that's a good times. thing isn't it isn't it Dan... well yeah yeah it is but then it is but the last five times they've trailed in all competitions they've lost the game uh. it's a test at some point you suspect they will have that do you test. and where do you think that the... point is can you get their fixtures Spurs up Spurs away, away United oh, okay. away there's they're, your answer yeah, they're, they're, they're... Say they've got the they've got the circus <laughs> haven't they so... even Wolves away is only a few days after the buy in second leg is a, is a tough one. It's those three away games. They're, those, there are only three away games left. They're all very hard. But I mean, they, as much as we talk about, you know, what title winning teams do is get last minute winners and stuff. 
more what they've done in the last few years is do what City do, which is wins like Brighton away. You go and surgically deal with a really tricky away game. You can see no chances. You're ruthless. At the, and I can't see Liverpool at the moment going away and producing a performance like Arsenal did at Brighton. I'm not even sure I can see City doing that, the way they played at Palace. Right now, the, the only thing... I think the main thing going against Arsenal is their recent history. Right. The fact that obviously last season they didn't last the course. They've had a bad record over the last decade, basically, of fluffing run-ins. But number, you know, scored the most, conceded the fewest. I mean, just, I mean, they've conceded quite a few fewer than Liverpool anyway. But mm. expected-wise, they've conceded 21 expected goals Arsenal this season. Liverpool are 36. It's a big old gap, and that's always supposedly the indicator of future. Performance. Well, the the other important numbers about goals, of course, is goal difference, which increasingly possible that it, it could come down to this and Arsenal streets ahead on on that metric. I haven't look, looked at the circuitry of the supercomputer, but I suspect there is an element of um, Manchester City have won the last three titles and therefore generally seem to get it done at this time of year. Um, got e- easier Arsenal games have, as well. Yeah, yeah they, games? they do have easier games, oh, yeah. undoubtedly. Right. Yes, um, I think. Yeah, I mean. But having watched Arsenal against Brighton, if they play like that against every other team this season, they'll win the game. Because, you know, we talked about at length there about Liverpool and unable to deal with Manchester United's chaos. Arsenal are the team in the country, as Charlie says, who look better at being able to play their own game, not get caught up in any kind of bizarre antics or chaos of an opponent and just do their thing and get it right. And if, if, if Arsenal have... 28 shots at Old Trafford, I think they'll score more than twice and I don't think they'll concede twice. I think they'll win the game. So, um, yeah, it's 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 an odd weekend in that I, I thought they were less likely to win the title after they drew with Manchester City than they were before it. And now, because of factors, they will suddenly consider themselves favourites. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's four against in 11 games this calendar year in the league. Um, I mean, that, that Old Trafford, Old Trafford has been such a graveyard for them. That's a ground they... The last time they won with fans there at the league was 2006. Their only league win since was in lockdown behind closed doors game. But right. it's, it's a long, long time. And whatever the situation, no matter how good they've been, how bad United have been, United have found a way. So that... And, and obviously the North I'm not Dark sure that this, un, that this United... Sorry, that United have ever been this bad and Arsenal this good since certainly two, that early noughties. There probably hasn't been... Yeah, that disparity. But there have been some bad United teams that have yeah. found... I mean, the, Rash, the game Rashford... Scored two on what was, I think, his Premier League debut. The United team that day was bad. And they somehow just found a way, you know. And Arsenal were going for the title that day as well. Right. You, they, I think they were top. You mentioned it a minute ago, but obviously it's Arsenal's first Champions League quarterfinal time. What, right. 13, 14 years or, or something? 14, yeah. 14 years. Gordon Brown was PM. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Depending on what happens over the course of those two legs, let's say Arsenal get knocked out against the Bayern team that's just in absolute free fall and Harry Kane scores a hat-trick against Arsenal just for argument's sake. Can you see the psychological blow of that just derailing the rest of their, their season? Do you know what? I don't know if it's necessarily that, but I, I think Arsenal have definitely gone up a level from where they were last season. But what they're kind of being asked to do is go up two levels because they're having to navigate the Champions League as well. Right. And that's a really big ask. To be able to do both... I think if they weren't in the Champions League... Mm. I think there's everything there for them to win the league. That is the big unknown, though, is can they deal physically, emotionally with those turnarounds? Right, they feed into each other. As you say, that can have a negative consequence and it could also have a positive one. They are facing a Bayern team who have caused them so much pain in the past, but never have this Bayern team look so beatable, as we saw at the weekend, 2-0 up against Heidenheim (laughs) and contriving to lose 3-2. I was just going to say, the the other thing about the Champions League, if Arsenal do... Then the second leg of that semi-final is three days before the Man United game on the 11th. Crikey. Yeah. If you asked uh, Mikel Teta, honestly, I think he would prefer that Man United game to be three weeks earlier in kind of mid-April than than mid-May because that is kind of crunch time, that second last weekend of the season. When United um, might have players back as well. Mm, But even, you know, they go to Wolves three days after the second leg at Bayern. Whatever happens there, that's a a big ask. Emotionally. We'll we'll talk about Wolves-Arsenal (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> further on down there at Spring well, Pedro Neto be but <laughs> in, the, in the meantime also facing 
a tough Champions League fixture this week are Man City, who are going to be away at Real Madrid. And at the weekend, they got warmed up for that nicely with a 4-2 win coming from behind against Crystal Palace. It turns out Kevin De Bruyne isn't ready for the glue factory just yet. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Pep Guardiola is just the gift that keeps on giving. Foden scores a hat-trick and he's the darling of the, the entire world. And then he, then he gets dropped to the bench with one eye on Real Madrid. Um, City go a goal behind in this game. Mateta mm. produces a, it's a decent strike, but um, probably a few questions to be asked about Man City's, um, where their defenders were in the build-up to that goal. But, you know, when you've got De Bruyne and Haaland, you can just turn it on and, and De Bruyne scores a couple of great goals. I think it's also important to point out, Grealish gets the pre-assist for, I think, three of the four goals. Um, so he shouldn't underestimate his influence because obviously he's been a bit hit and miss this season compared to some of the numbers he was producing last season. But when you've got players like that, you can, you can always kind of navigate these fixtures, which it could have been a bit of a, a tricky one, but they, they've managed to pull through. OK. Conceding the first goal, as has been often the case this season. Not sure how much of a worry that is. How much of a factor in their title hopes these two games against Real Madrid and what follows after is going to be. Anyone else got a hot take on City? No, I, th- I was just surprised in the first half and Pep talked about it after how many kind of errors there were and mm. how open they looked. He talked about it that, you know, it's just playing all the time. That can happen. And obviously there's no one better at City than navigating that kind of packed schedule. I mean, they won the treble last season. I, I mean, I always... It's always impossible, really, to go against them just because of that recent history. Um, but yeah, this wasn't the first time where they have looked a bit shaky defensively. Mm. And it's odd, you know, for them to be so far behind on goal difference, another team, they're normally just miles out in front. Yeah. There's one stat about this game that most people won't have picked up, and you won't believe what it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something that didn't happen, and that Rodri didn't get booked. Uh, Rodri picked up seven yellows I think in his first 11 games of this season no sorry say that again Rodri picked up seven yellows in his first 17 games of this season I think um, which included a a ban for yellow cards but after the end of next weekend uh, or the team's 32nd game of the season if you pick up 10 then you get your two game suspension so Rodri has somehow managed to only get one yellow card in his last 11 games and therefore will not be able to pick up enough. So he will be, assuming he stays fit, he will be available for the rest of the season. And that was a worry for Man City fans a couple of months ago when he had kind of, as I say, seven from 17. They were looking at him thinking, well, two two or three more yellows in these next 15 games seems perfectly reasonable. And that would basically rule him out of big, big games um, in the Premier League. So I thought he was actually really, probably had his worst game of the season against Crystal Palace. He looked a bit shaky. Uh, he made a couple of mistakes to set up Palace chances. But yeah, him not getting booked is is a huge deal because he is the, the kind of still point in that turning. Mm. All right. Man City will be travelling to Real Madrid that game on Tuesday. That same night, Arsenal host Bayern at the Emirates. Thursday, Liverpool have European commitments. They're going to be taking on Atalanta, who lost actually uh, this weekend, perhaps with one eye on that Europa League clash. They lost to Claudio Ranieri's brave Cagliari. Now, we'll talk about probably that game and what happened this weekend in Europe and what to expect from the midweek matches in our Euro Totally Football show, which we're going to be recording a little bit later on, on this Monday. So look out for that. Next up in this show, it's the other end of the Premier League. Full-time year at the Athletics Women's Football Podcast will be out on Tuesday. Amongst the topics covered there, I would expect England's disappointing draw with Sweden and Euro qualifying last Friday. Mm. Now, Premier League, drama at the bottom. Uh, two teams in the bottom five actually winning this weekend. You had Luton with their first victory in 11. Everton with their first in 14 against second from bottom Burnley. Elsewhere, Forest losing at Spurs. And bottom of the table, Sheffield United getting that 2-2 draw with Chelsea. Not a televised match. Was anyone able to get across this? With what seen, <clears throat> seen the highlights. Yeah. And um, I remember after they beat Manchester United, Pochettino was very um, clear about this should be a moment where the team and the, the fan base are united. This can be an opportunity for us to improve the... 
constant kind of feeling of just dissatisfaction around Stamford Bridge at the moment. Cut to scene two, Bramall Lane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, Noni Madueke is interviewed afterwards and he just says, this is sort of our Achilles heel this season. Every time we've got an opportunity to, to get momentum, right. we just completely throw it away. Um, I saw a, a funny tweet from Liam Toomey that basically said, is there any team in the world that couldn't score at least two goals against Chelsea at the moment? I think it sums it up, their situation, pretty, pretty succinctly. They're just do some things going forward very well, but then at the back, just some of the poor decision-making and right. uh, obviously inexperience plays a factor, but this really should have been a game that Chelsea should have gone on and won and really, um, like I said, built the momentum from the, the victory over Manchester United and instead they just completely threw it away. Yeah, they led twice, Blades battling back. It was Ollie McBurney who got the, again, a stoppage time equaliser for them. Chelsea only had six shots Comfortably the fewest that a team has had against Sheffield United all season. Uh, it, I mean, who would have thought back in August, who would have thought you know, that we'd be talking about billion pound Chelsea going to Bramall Lane and only getting a point and it not actually being all that surprising? Mm. It would have been a weird thing to think about to go that granular, but I, t but I agree. Well, you're busy <laughs> off with our Arsenal <laughs> Wolves from... <laughs> Yeah, no, fair point. Charlie, fair very point. about that. Fair no, I, no, no, I'm being facetious. You're right. I mean, Ch Chelsea as well, they, the weird thing is they're more in with a top six shout. I think because they've got, they've played a lot less than everyone, but mm. like they're only five points behind sixth place United with a game in hand. Had they won yesterday, that would have been three behind with a game in hand and a better goal difference. Like right. they're not a million miles away from it, despite what's been such a topsy-turvy season okay by my reckoning you're looking at probably five in the Champions League six seven in Europa League and eighth in Europa Conference League and they are currently three behind in Newcastle with as you say a game in hand so it could be Conference League football for, for the next season yay or, or Europa League I mean they're not yeah they're, they're I mean, close enough possible, isn't it? Daniel yeah I just I mean we talked about Manchester United chaos but Chelsea's 30 league games have had 25 goals in the last 10 minutes which is just just the, the inability to manage games and the, the, the necessity to kind of play on the edge of their nerves to try and get something from games, uh, as we've seen in the last five days, in both in both kind of extremes is just is bizarre. And I mean, yeah, I, I, it's the youngest team in the Premier League. That's the, right. that's the defence. It's the average age is 23.6. It's something that, that Ten Hag said about Manchester United. Actually, Man United are very mid table for average age. Um, Chelsea are comfortably this, the, the youngest team in the league but when you buy a lot of those players for £60 million pounds plus um, it kind of reduces the, the patience in that and reduces the sympathy for the mania that they produce mm. And There are many parallels with Man United and, and, and one would be perhaps the fact that maybe there's not the decision making structure in the club in place to take the kind of move on Pochettino that maybe in a sane club you'd be thinking right now, this isn't working, we need to make a change. But rather than discuss that, let's have a word about what's happening with Sheffield United. Is is something going on there at Bramall Lane? Well, they're, they're certainly trying. I remember it was, I think it was 2016, Jodian Lescott got a load of flack when Aston Villa had the relegation confirmed. And he said, actually, in some ways, it's a relief because it allows us to focus on just playing football for a bit without this kind of haunting sword of Damocles above us. And he got a load of grief and he expressed it badly, but I get it. And it does feel like Sheffield United are kind of in that situation now. They know they're going down. They've scored more than a quarter of their league goals this season in the last four matches. Ooh. They scored three against Fulham. They scored uh, against Liverpool at Anfield. They scored two against Chelsea. They're, you know, they are enjoying themselves. Um, and that's necessary because if, if Sheffield United had, ended the season as they started it that really does provide a hangover for next season and calls into question Chris Wilder's job if they continue to do okay to the end of the season it probably sets them up all right for for next year um and you know for goodness sake like thank give the fans something to cheer over the last few weeks of the season because it's been grim from August to April to be mm. fair as well didn't Julian Lescott tweet a picture of his car not long before he said that <laughs> yeah that was also a mistake <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There were other reasons why that didn't go down especially well. Well, we should add, he claimed it was mm. by accident, of course. Right. Sheffield United, uh, by contrast, do seem to be going down uh, well, uh, as well as you can in these circumstances. Battling bravely against the dying of the light. Everton, meanwhile, 
who inflicted uh, a 1-0 defeat on second from bottom Burnley. That is Everton's first Premier League win since December, which also came against Burnley, who are, of course, Sean Dyche, Everton manager's former side. Not sure what to make of that. It's two goals in two games for Dominic Calvert-Lewin now, although this one owed an awful lot to the man hailed as being part of the Burnley renaissance, that four-game unbeaten run, the goalkeeper Muric. Yeah, I don't know if it's a pattern, but I was at Anfield last week where it's very like that. Sheffield United's goalkeeper whacked a, a clearance into Darwin Nunes. I don't know if there's a, a kind of an element of you know defensive or teams towards the bottom of the table thinking, let's just calm down, let's just take our time with things and then inviting pressure. But yeah, fair play to Dominic Calvert-Lewin because dashing and kind of herring at goalkeepers to get his body in the way is not necessarily what kind of unfairly people associate mm. him with. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a comedy goal that kind of looped over uh, Muric and in. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, the, the best player by a mile was, was Branthwaite again, who's clearly going to have to be sold in the summer. But Vincent Company after the game, obviously a, a, someone who knows one or two things about being a centre-back, by the way, is, yeah, he was just kind of in awe of how good Branthe was at stopping his strikers. So that was the game, I think. Brilliant. Uh, Everton, as has been widely reported, could be facing a further points deduction this week for PSR breach. It's interesting comments by their manager, Sean Dyche, afterwards where he was just repeating, none of this happened on my watch. And had I been here at the time, <laughs> I would have been saying no, 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 because... I look after the club and I need to know that the club is going to be all right in the in the long term. And I don't doubt his sincerity on that. Uh, in the meantime, there is this sensation that Everton, if they if they do get done again, could be the last club to actually suffer a points penalty for PSR because mm. the Premier League's decided that they don't fancy any more of this kind of thing in future seasons. Is yeah, that... well, certain clubs probably feel that way. Anyway. Right. So the, the word is that instead it'll be fines for overspending your... Supposedly. I, yeah. I mean, that's not been agreed, but yeah, that's the suggestion. And this will be coming to a vote, what, in June or something? Is that something right? like that. Okay. All right. Well, we can look at that when it happens. But yes, big three points for Everton, who are now four points clear of the bottom three as we await for what this week might bring. Luton, meanwhile, just goal difference behind Nottingham Forest after they got revenge on the Cherries for that extraordinary match last month when they were 3-0 up and lost 4-3 at the Vitality. This time around, a 2-1 win against Bournemouth. First time that Luton have ever won a Premier League match after conceding the first goal. Crikey. I, mean, I have to say, as well, I was really pleased with them because they've had so many really close games go the other way and they've conceded late goals. And, you know, I guess similar thinking just now about Calvert-Lewin, he's had a pretty rough season where things haven't dropped for him. Then he gets his bit of luck. Or we were saying maybe, you know, Liverpool have had a lot of these tight harem scaring games. This one goes against them. So I guess we're at that sort of the season where if you believe in things kind of correcting themselves, be that luck or whatever, you subscribe to but yeah I just I, I thought Luton really they they deserve this they had one of these coming because they have they've had so many heartbreaking late goals go against them mm. all right still inside the bottom three on goal difference but we'll talk about the team just above them Forest, and what they got up to against Spurs and what Spurs did to them and also Jay about your trip to Villa Park for that 3-3 with Brentford next outside the Premier League big weekend of course listener you'll have seen that Rangers drew 3-3 with Celtic in the old firm game, in the old farm game, meanwhile, which was also this weekend, Norwich beat the championship leaders at Ipswich 1-0, which means that Leicester moved past the Tractor Boys into the lead in that most... Top I was going to call it the most topsy-turvy of divisions, but and maybe the Premier League is mounting a serious challenge <coughs> for that title. Oh, uh in Leicester's game against Birmingham City. Oh, yeah. There was a, I know Daniel just mentioned it, but there was a goalkeeper getting caught out from a goal kick in that game Ooh. as well. Mm. All right. Now, Premier League. Spurs have climbed back above Aston Villa into fourth place, which doesn't have quite the same drama to it now that we all assume the Premier League is going to get five spots. But anyway, there they are in fourth. It's only on goal difference for now. Spurs do have a game in hand, though. They beat Forest. Villa drew with Brentford. Now, Charlie, you were there at uh, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium to witness Nuno Espirito Santo's mm. first return to the club that he managed for so very, very long. Mm. Um, 
There, am I right in saying, and I, I'm sure that Daniel is a bit of a forest aficionado you, yourself, you'll have a view on this, but there are not too distant parallel universes in which Forest win this game. Um, maybe. There are certainly parallel universes in which they go 2-1 up. Okay. Had... Are we thinking about the Murillo chance from uh, even further downtown? <laughs> Or, or what about the Chris well, Wood the, no, miss yeah, the, about the, an inch away from... From very much uptown, yeah. Chris Wood, yeah. Um, <laughs> in the mo he approached it in the most Chris Wood way imaginable, kind of three yards out. I'm going to absolutely smash this as hard as I can. Wood on wood action. Very much so. <laughs> um, to be honest, I think even if that had gone in, the way Spurs are in second halves, they probably would have won 3-2 or something really? like that. Yeah, okay. they just... like. 14 of their last 16 goals have been in second halves. They really come to life. They chuck players on. They play with a lot of energy late on. I think what's what you could say more is the possible James Madison red card. Uh, um, yeah. You know, had that had he been sent off for that, then, yeah, you are looking at a very different game. Okay. Well, that was a big bone of contention, actually, for Forrest. A uh, apparent punch from Madison on... Ryan Yates? Yeah, who, and they'd been at each other all game. it didn't go to VAR? Or well, it, it must have been looked at, but right. it didn't go to a kind of on-screen review or any delay okay. at the time. Do you just wonder, with something like this, where it's such an extreme punishment, you know, that he's taken out for three and a half games, essentially, ten, basically 10% of the Premier League season for something hmm. that's, that's kind of an act of frustration. And I wonder if that feeds into those who make the decisions, into their thinking, because it does become a really big call. I think that probably, that could be a red and the punishment should just be, look, you're out for the rest of the game kind of thing. But Maybe it becomes, a sim bin, Charlie. Maybe well, a sim that bin. sort of thing. It reminds yeah. me, there used to be that time in the Premier League where any last man red uh, foul was a red card, a penalty, you're off, you're banned. Right. And, and I remember some refs kind of wavering because they were like, this feels like too big a decision. Yeah. And I think this maybe was one of those. Okay. Well, you can understand Forrest's frustration over it. Of course, because those are the laws. Well, so. yeah. Can I say, hmm. I remember earlier in the season, Rodri put his hand around Morgan Gibbs-White's oh, yeah. throat right and got banned for three games. Mm. I'm not saying they're the same act because they're two different things, but they belong in yeah. the same... Is it because Modri... Sorry. He raised it... his hand. No, no, sorry. I was going to say, is it because Rodri just looks way more menacing than Madison <laughs> does? We're the best will in the world. VAR couldn't take it seriously because it's Madison. Um, well, as it turned out, it was Spurs that won 3-1. Two screamers uh, from defenders earning on the three points. Van der Ven and Pedro Porro. Now, um, is it possible to put a figure on how much love Spurs fans have for Mickey van der Ven right now? Could this approach some levels, do you think? Ooh, I mean, a little way to go there, mm. only in his first season. But yeah, he is absolutely adored. And he's just so important to how... Spurs play they miss him so much when he's not there with his pace he can, they can push so much further up uh, he really is becoming like their most important player um, or certainly the player they can least do without and the, right. the numbers kind of bear that out with and without him this season uh, he's, he's fantastic and he's got partly with that fan connection he does have that presence he's got something about him he likes putting in big tackles seeing him like glide across the ground so quickly is a sight to behold as well against some really quick play I mean Alanga as well who's obviously rapid you had those two kind of on the same side and Werner on that side of the pitch right mm. in front of us in the first half I can't remember seeing like such a quick trio of players in the game but Van, Van de Ven's fantastic and that goal was Whoa. yeah what a hit what a hit just to say on, on the numbers that he I mean he's he's started 20 league games Spurs have won 13 and lost two of those he's failed to start 11 games and Spurs have lost five in terms of those numbers he's not just Spurs most important player he's kind of the most bellwether yeah. player in the really? Premier League in terms of yeah being with and without yeah which it, you know it, at the age of 22 when he signed in his first season in mm. England is Ludicrous. Again, uh, with win with or without frowned upon by the stats uh, community. Should just add is that, that right? <laughs> yeah, I, but I mean, all the more reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nail Why, what's the, the issue mass? there? I think actually. because it's hard to prove ten other players. It's hard yeah. to prove causation rather than just correlation. But Rodri. But Rodri. That yeah. I guess I guess when there's an over. I guess when there are that many numbers. But yeah, yeah you can maybe start talking about it. Okay. You know, and with Van der Ven, I mean, the pace in the high line, like it, it is blatant. Of course, the of course. There, it's it, so clear. It completely changes the way they play. And also one of those two defeats that Daniel mentions, he had to come off 
before half time injured mm. and they fell apart, you know, after he so even within that game you, you could see the difference with them and that him. I think the other one was the other one was Chelsea, wasn't it? Where Spurs were playing with No, that it was that so, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was that one, one, the yeah. only game the only other one was Wolves at home. Um but yeah, generally it, it's just yeah, enormous difference with him in the team. All right. Big win anyway for Spurs who move above Aston Villa on goal difference. Aston Villa, who had that 3-3 draw at home to Brentford. Jay, you were there. Brentford with the worst away record in the Premier League coming into this weekend. And second half gets underway, you're 2-0 down. You must have been thinking, ah, oh, here we go again. <laughs> I was thinking this could get ugly. It could be 3-4-5-0. And, um, and after the game, ask Thomas Frank, um, because he said that he was disappointed with the first half performance. I mm. said, oh, well, what did you change at half time? And he said lots of things and it was f***ed after 50 seconds. <laughs> uh, so I always quite like it when managers uh, just uh, dispense with any politeness and just go full-blown swear mode. Um, the actual big news before kickoff was that Tony was, was named on the bench. Right. And there's a l- little bit of a strange backstory to this where when Brentford played Brighton on Wednesday, he didn't finish the warm-up and he made a bit of a gesture to the medical staff to say that He wasn't feeling 100%. Ends up playing 90 minutes. Um, Brentford's official Twitter account did actually briefly put out a a statement saying that Tony had been dropped on Wednesday and Mbuma would be starting and it was hastily deleted. But Tony plays all 90 minutes. And then on Saturday, he, he comes on for the final 10 minutes of the game. But Thomas Frank basically said he's got a small hip injury. Um, and we didn't want to kind of risk him. Their next three games are against Luton, Sheffield United and Everton. So mm. so massive. So that was a, a little bit strange and kind of sums up Brentford season that they just seem to be ridiculously unlucky with injuries. But um, yeah, Aston Villa just looked like they were absolutely cruising. Ollie Watkins used to be absolutely adored by the Brentford fans and I think he's now public enemy number one. Um, some of the defending for Morgan Rogers' goal for Aston Villa was, was not the best from Brentford. And then in this crazy nine minutes, they score three times. The first goal was so scruffy and scrappy. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I still can't work out if Damsgaard is shooting or crossing. It, you know, goes in off Zanka's standing leg. And I think Aston Villa was so shocked that Brentford had managed to score a goal in quite farcical circumstances that Brentford just suddenly were, had this massive confidence boost, scored twice, but still couldn't hold on for the win. Right. And I think... Getting a point at Villa Park is a good result, but because Everton and, and Luton won, right. it frames it in a different way. And now they're four points above the relegation zone and they've got these massive free fixtures, as I said, coming up. Right. And things are just very tense in the world. So of Sheffield United next. Who they lost to earlier this season. Right, that's at home. And then away to Luton, who which feels a feisty bunch. L- Luton away feels huge for Brentford season and Luton season. Whoever, if Brentford win that, you'd right. think they're going to be fine. If Luton win that, then you feel like it's going to go all the way to the final day of the season. Wow, and Everton following that. Crikey, that's at Goodison. Forest have a, a kind of newfound rival, would you say, with Brentford I think so. over the last couple of years? It's been spiky, but yeah, every Forest fan is very much team Brentford over <laughs> the next three weekends because, as you say, they basically play they basically play everyone who is a threat to everybody else. But this must there. be, Jay, pretty much the first time all season that Brentford have had Wissa, Tony and Mbomo all available. And yeah. you'd think that would make a massive difference. Yeah, so Mbomo and Tony have still not started a game together since May last year. Because yeah. obviously Mbomo has wow. been eased back from, yeah. his, um, from his own ankle injury and then Tony was dropped for, for this game. But came on for what, the last 10 minutes? Or came so? on for the final 10 minutes and then had an argument with Nathan Collins mm. that I'm not too sure if people saw Sky Sports kind of put it out on their social media channels. And I think it was just a, an argument between what they should have done with the final kick of the game. Um, Collins had the ball and he decided to play it forward to Christopher Iyer, tempted a fancy flick and it came to nothing. And Tony was kind of lurking at the back post. And I think Tony was basically saying, you should have just crossed the ball into the box and gambled that I was going to win it in the air. But I think Tony didn't look amazing when he came on. Okay, it was a small sample size and he looked a little bit rusty um, on Wednesday against Brighton as well. Mm. As Thomas Frank said, carrying this bit of a hip injury. So I kind of understand why Collins didn't hail Mary and just mm. throw it into the box. Is he going to be fit for this this crucial run of three games? Thomas Frank said he'll definitely be ready for Sheffield United, but we'll we'll see. How 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 confident are you about Brentford? Um I think they should win one or two more games before the end of the season. I think they'll kind of stumble over the line. Uh-huh. I think 
they finished ninth last season and there was a really confident feeling around the club that they could maybe challenge for the top 10 again and, and it's been a real probably a little bit of a reality check for them their first two seasons in the Premier League apart from what from one minor stumble um, in their debut season mm. has pretty much been as perfect as you could have expected it they had mm. the whole Christian Eriksen um, fantasy you know Ivan Tony became you know I think the first Brentford player to play for England since 1937 or something ridiculous. Everything was just going swimming well. And then this season has been a little bit of a reality check. So okay. many injuries, but they have been really unlucky. Yeah. We've been talking about some of the big clubs who are looking mm. for someone to put their put their teams <laughs> back in order. What are the chances that f***ing Thomas Frank will, be, <laughs> will still be at the GTEC next season? It's a strange one because... I was on the Athletic Football Podcast last week talking about Thomas Frank and Roberto De Zerbi's futures. Right. And last season, it seemed like every vacancy Thomas Frank was linked with. Um, Aston Villa, Leicester City, Southampton. And I know that there was certainly, I think, an inquiry from Aston Villa before they appointed Unai Emery. And I think mm. Emery was always their number one choice. But certainly there were a, f a few discussions there. Thomas Frank could have left Brentford last season after they'd finished ninth on a, on a high. And I also thought that Tottenham would have been an, an opportunity which maybe would have made a little bit of sense for him. But now, I almost feel like, from his perspective, he's stuck in a, a little bit of limbo. I think he deserves the chance to uh, manage a top six, top eight team. I just don't know. I don't think there's an, any obvious answer as to who that would be. I don't think he'd end up at Manchester United, All Chelsea right, and there's no concrete moves out there of people... No, uh, no, I don't think so. And, and I think... Thomas Frank's been at Brentford as a head coach for five and a half years, mm. as assistant coach for another two years on top of that. I think it would have to take a lot for him to sacrifice it for a sideways move because he's he's got all the, not all the power in the world at Brentford, but he knows that he's going to be supported regardless. Mm. He could go to a different team. I see quite a few people always say about, oh, why doesn't he go to West Ham? I don't really see, I don't think there's, yes, I know West Ham are in Europe, but I think Thomas Frank's, Ambitions are probably a little bit higher than that. Maybe I'm wrong. Bayern's the one, isn't it? Bayern's the one that, if I was his agent, I'd be thinking, well, if they're struggling to name someone else, Bayern's mm. the, the dream job. I know it's yeah. a huge job. Bayern but Munich. It would be a big gamble. But yeah, but if you look at the other managers, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're reportedly talking to um, Julian well, Nagelsmann yeah. again because they don't really <laughs> know which direction to go in. We'll so, get an update on that in our Tuesday show, which will be a little bit later on. We'll be recording that a little bit later on today, so Monday. But yeah, certainly that was the last thing that seemed to be. Yeah, yeah, uh, very good. West Ham, though, Jay. Thanks for mentioning them because they had that two-one win away at Wolves, an eventful match. There was an Olympico, a goal straight from the corner from James Ward Flag, uh, <laughs> James Ward Flag, <laughs> James Ward Prowse. Yeah, Wolves felt they should have had a uh, equaliser. From Max Kilman, 99th minute. But the... Okay, so who was deemed to be offside here? Tawanda Chiroa. Yeah. And Gary O'Neill called this the worst decision he's ever seen. There's probably some sympathy, sympathy for his view on that, is there? Yeah. No? Daniel, I, no? Yeah, yes. Yes. Yes, but it's a subjective mm. decision. Uh, he, There's no doubt that Fabianski has to kind of move to get a better view. I don't think he's saving it anyway. But I think it, it was funny in that O'Neill had this huge rant. And at the end of this rant, he said, technically, it might be right by the letter of the law, but then the law needs right. to change. And I think, OK, well, then fine, fine. Um, the, so there's a clear frustration anyway with the interpretation of that law. I get that. The, the, the thing that made me laugh is he was like, David Moyes agreed it was scandalous and terrible and horrendous. And then like a minute later, Moyes trots out in front of the microphone and goes, I thought it was a great decision, to be honest. So, no. that, that's what I enjoyed it's, most. It's very much like only as that get given in the age of VAR, but that's what, you know, we've... Sort that's of where we live. That's where we live. And, I, and, you know, I agree about the laws thing and, you know, going back to that Madison one, I can see why Forrester frustrated because, you know, mm. by the letter of the law... Uh, you think why why isn't that enforced? And then you yeah you have sometimes VARs referees applying the laws very by the book, and other times not. Um, but yeah, I think also there's the context obviously you know of Wolves uh, having had quite a few decisions go against them this season. But look, it'll be fascinating to see how they do against Arsenal in that game in a few weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> And also, we should say, Wolves are on a pretty tricky run at the moment. They've, they, you know, I think they've they got knocked out of the FA Cup by Coventry. They, they've drawn a couple of games they'd like to win at Burnley and lost this game. I think O'Neill is, 
you know, he's he's frustrated at the moment anyway about the lack of signing of a striker in January mm. because that he, has held them back a bit. I think there's a kind of yeah a general mounting frustration, but yeah, it did make me laugh that he was just like Moyes says it's a scandal, and then Moyes <laughs> like Moyes says it's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. David Moyes will be uh, off to uh, Leverkusen, possibly even as we speak. Uh, by Leverkusen is who West Ham have Thursday in the Europa League. You couldn't ask for a tougher opponent in that competition, or possibly in Europe, because they are still unbeaten all this season. 41 matches in all competitions by Leverkusen. They are now, I think, 16 points clear at the top of the Bundesliga, which they, means... Sorry, can they win on... They can win next weekend. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Never won a title before. Used to be called Neverkusen. Now it's never losing, and it's uh, and this could be quite big. West Ham may well be without Jared Bowen for mm. that trip. Their Swiss Army knife of an attacking midfielder, stroke forward. I think that's a mistake from. I think that was a mistake from Moyes. He he is not generally prone to rotation. He didn't really do it in the last couple of European seasons, and he also makes fewer subs than any other Premier League manager. Moyes, um, and yeah, I just think. He had Maxwell Corney on the bench, who he, he, he doesn't seem to rate, but with Leverkusen coming up this midweek, that was probably a mistake. Mm. All right, well, we'll preview that game, of course, in Tuesday's Euros show. The one other match from the Premier League, just to wrap things up, was Fulham's 1-0 defeat at home to Newcastle. The goal coming from Bruno Guimaraes late on. Newcastle keeping a clean sheet. Newcastle just continuing their poor run against the Magpies. Anything hugely significant about this game that will be that we should uh, flag up before we finish up? Well, we talked about Rodri avoiding yellow card. Palinha, who's oh, the yeah. kind of yellow card magnet, mm. man managed to avoid one. Ooh. I think he's possibly the, one of the only players who could end up with 15 uh, this season, which is some going. I think it's never been done in the Premier League record. Say, in the who, Premier League. Who, who holds the record for the most yellow cards in one season? I feel it's, like Matteo Flamini used to be like a walking yellow card, but it's a joint. There was no there's the <coughs> what's the Watford player? He got fourteen, which is a joint record. Um Holobas. Yes. Ain't no Holobas girl, yeah. yeah. He, and there was <laughs> Yeah, apparently there was, it is, it's Kapuwe and Holiday, it? yeah. so we were both right. Yeah, 14. And Katamol, Teote, <coughs> Ince, Savage. There's a lot of players who have got 14. Okay. I mean, What's Katamol the most surprising name Hughes. on that list? Is there someone that you would not expect? Well, Mark Hughes is the only striker, but I'm not sure you'd say it was surprising mm. that he got booked. Um, I'd say Olivia Decor for Everton. He, he likes to tackle, But maybe he? just because it's quite a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, by the way. Uh, you've, your Robbie Savages are on there. Your Paul so no one's ever beaten um, 14? No. But Paulinho, could, he's got it in his locker. How many is he on He's now? on 12. He got 14 last season as well. Yeah. So oh, wow. that's wow. pretty Real good effort. 26 that's... in less than I mean, the, the weird seasons. thing just uh, on Fulham generally is oh. I was at the Spurs game, Fulham 3, Spurs 0, a few weeks ago, and they were brilliant. Mm. Really, really good. And then since then, they scraped a draw uh, away at Sheffield United. They lost this game. And they lost in midweek as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we've 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 asked some of the finest minds in podcasting what's what's the story with Fulham and their incredible inconsistency. And uh, as yet, I don't think we've really come up with a de definitive answer. And but they they host both City and Liverpool um, between now and the end of the season. Mm. And so, if they continue their current form against one of those teams, they'll be brilliant, and one they'll be terrible. And it's just a question of which. Real community chess of a football fixture, <laughs> that one. <laughs> the, other, the other thing I was going to say about Fulham is, has a transfer gone less well this season than Armando Broder's <laughs> yeah. January yeah. loan move to Fulham? He's just not played at all. It's, it's but, ludicrous. Uh, they paid a fairly significant loan fee. Well, yeah. Like a punitive fee for not playing him yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow. Mm. All right. Maybe they'll be better next week for Fulham, who are up against ooh, West Ham. Big derby. Uh, but anyway, there'll be time to talk about those fixtures and more in our Thursday show. When we'll be reviewing, of course, the Champions League action and ting. Uh, for now, that, I think, wraps it up for our coverage of Match Day 30-something. Many thanks to Daniel as ever. And to you, Jay Harris and Charlie Eccleshare, Liam and producer Charlie in the booth. You listeners, sorry it was up a little bit later. Hope you appreciate the more considered... 
nature of the show. Basically just meant we had uh, a chance to read uh, what everyone else said, like Daniel Story in The Score and The Eye and the brilliant athletic post-game uh, summaries as well. Uh, we'll be back with more of the same on Thursday and Tuesday with the Euro Show. Do join us for that. For now, from all of us here, it's goodbye. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around, and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.